this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to do another Smackdown that will get the fanboys roaring. The iPhone 5S here, the Samsung Galaxy S5, or as I've come to call it, Muppets, Puppets, and Tools, because that's what you folks have been calling each other in the YouTube comment section. Hey guys, you know, they're both really awesome phones, and we're going to find out by looking at them now. All right, so here we have it. Yankees versus Red Sox. Republicans versus Democrats. I know you folks are going to go psycho for your favorite platform and favorite device here, but really, this is the big competition. Samsung, thanks to a whole lot of marketing and some neat products, has gotten really huge in the smartphone business. And obviously, we know Apple and the iPhone is the juggernaut in the industry. So here they are facing off yet again, both with the number 5 in the model number. iPhone 5S, this one came out a while ago now, and the Samsung Galaxy S5. First off, notice the difference in size. For some people, bigger is better. For other people, small it fits in my pocket and my hand is better. This one is up to you. There is no right answer here. This is not a true-false question. Just which one you like better. They're both gorgeous displays. The iPhone has an IPS display, 500 nits of brightness, good viewing angles. It looks painted on from the sides. 1136 by 640 resolution and 4 inches. Specs-wise, it's not a stunner, but in terms of quality and color accuracy, it is. Now, our Samsung Galaxy S5 has a Super AMOLED HD display, 5.1 inches, 1920 by 1080. So obviously, in terms of size and resolution, you got the winner here, but it also means carrying something larger in your pocket. So again, it, you know, it, it, it depends on what you can tolerate there, but from a pure resolution and how much you can see on screen at a given time and how much more enjoyable videos are and reading more web pages, obviously the bigger device is going to be superior in that respect. So now we'll demo video playback so you can get an idea of the experience difference between these two and we're going to play one of our own YouTube videos because the DRM police would have a fit if we actually used some real hot movie trailer. So, sorry about that. You get to watch the HTC M8 versus Samsung Galaxy S5 Smackdown. First on the Samsung. Big, so beautiful, here, nice. Some of the same things are going to apply, but going to be something You know, we've done something like this about a year ago. Funny that. This time it's and the now Galaxy Mini S5 Lisa. versus the HTC One M8. Now, last year we did the Galaxy S4 versus the HTC One at that time just called One, now M7. I don't know about you, but I think probably most anybody would choose the bigger, higher resolution display if you can live with the device size again. So let's start with the Oh, well, the obvious thing, and this happens every iPhone versus Galaxy comparison, but not as bad as before. I will say that the Samsung Galaxy S5 is my favorite Galaxy so far. Gone is the schmeary, shiny, greasy plastic on the back, replaced with this faux leather look. I really particularly like the black one because it has a more grippy, tactile feel. But you can get it in white, too. It's a little bit more slippery. It looks a little less, less like leather. But anyway, it's not a bad-looking phone. It's not a cheap or cheesy-looking phone. It has... Faux chrome on the sides. I really wish Samsung would at least go for faux aluminum because that would be more convincing. So it looks like a perfectly fine phone. It's not a standout gorgeous phone, but still, I think it's the nicest they've done. Now, the iPhone, as I say, it gives you one of those Rolex moments. From the front, it's nice looking, but from the back, or as Apple would like to say, Leica inspired, it, undeniably, it's gorgeous. It looks high quality. It's perfectly machined and put together. Lovely metal over here. Beautiful design. Apple is good at design. So when it comes to looks, for those of you who care about such things, I think the iPhone and the HTC One M8 actually are going to be the two winners for those of you who really like that classy metal look. Now when it comes to what's inside, Samsung on paper, well, they, they always win. They throw more features in there, more doodads, bigger display, higher resolution, all that kind of stuff. So on paper, Samsung Galaxy S5 is going to be a clear winner. Dual band Wi-Fi on both of these, we get 802.11ac on the Samsung versus just N on the iPhone. Now, I don't think that's going to be a huge difference to you guys because 802.11n is already faster than what most people, ISPs, are ever going to provide them in terms of data speeds in the near future. It's just for in-network in transfers where that, that speed difference could possibly make you feel a little bit happier. But anyway, still, it's nice forward thinking. We got AC, AC here. Both of them, of course, have Bluetooth 4.0. We get NFC in the Samsung. We don't. Apple still hasn't found a good use for NFC, at least in their book. They don't think so. The Samsung has a quad-core Snapdragon 801 processor. We have the dual-core Apple A7 inside the iPhone. But don't let that fool you too much because number of cores isn't everything. For example, 64-bit in the iPhone, 32-bit in the Samsung. 
later this year we'll probably see the first 64-bit Qualcomm CPUs, but on synthetic benchmarks that are cross-platform, they score similarly. The Snapdragon 801 is about the same as the Snapdragon 800 that came before it in terms of CPU performance. It's a little bit better on graphics, but you're really looking at about the same thing. And in terms of responsiveness, they're really very fast. It used to be that the iPhone was the hallmark of what was a speedy smartphone and Android lag behind, particularly Samsung with TouchWiz, because TouchWiz was a heavy overlay. They've managed to tune it. I wouldn't say that visually it's less noticeable and heavy, but it, it's, it's also very responsive and lag-free. So in terms of performance, I'm saying you're looking at the same thing here. Of course, Samsung has even more features. They have the IR blaster. You can control your home theater gear, your TV, your receiver, all that sort of thing. With the iPhone, you need a third-party accessory to do that sort of thing. They have the Smart Stay, where it uses the front camera to keep an eye on you, and if you're looking at the screen, it won't turn it off. In fact, there are so many features that half of them ship turned off on the Samsung, which leads into the other topic, software complexity. As ever, you guys know by now, Android versus iOS. iOS is simple. You have a grid of icons here. That, that's what there is. You can customize your wallpaper. You can move the icon arrangement around, but that's about all there is. Android, you can do your widgets, your customization, all that sort of thing. So for two different kinds of people, those of you who really want to customize the phone and make it your own, those who want to keep it simple. And that carries through to the simplicity of using the iPhone is, if you want to play music, you open the iTunes Music Player, for example. With the Samsung, since they particularly lay a lot of software on here and their own applications, you get like two music players, two video players, two web browsers. So you tap on a file and you're immediately presented with choices. Now, some of you who are less computer geeky, already hate it when your computer says, do you want to do this or do you want to do that, when you thought you were just straight ahead going to do something. So you might have a little of that same feeling here with, with the Samsung. You just want to play music. You don't want to have to make choices. But for those of you who are more comfortable with Android or with your product, you're used to downloading applications, then you'll probably be okay with that. In fact, you might download yet another music or video player that you prefer above all for, for those. And for you more advanced people, again, you can actually get something like Nova Launcher, one of the third-party launchers, to stream down and simplify the UI here. But again, that's getting more towards advanced users. The people who buy the iPhone probably don't want to have to go and buy a third-party launcher just to make it streamlined and simple. Applications also are visually very consistent on the iPhone. Most third-party developers do follow Apple's UI guidelines. Apple, of course, does. So pretty much your controls are going to be in the same place, very consistent across apps, and it's a little bit more hit or miss and roll your own with Android, too. So again, for those of you who just want it quick, simple, you don't have to think about it too much, you're probably going to say, give me iOS for that. But if you love features out the wazoo and all sorts of software customization, it's going to be the Samsung Galaxy S5. By the way, both of these are set to the same brightness now. The Samsung can achieve 500 nits of brightness, so can the iPhone. Like I said, the the iPhone has a slider plus auto brightness, so it's actually auto brightening a little bit more than the Samsung. So for those of you who know the difference, that's why. With the Samsung, if we use auto brightness in indoor location, it just runs the phone darker, so we have to turn that off. But anyway, on to next topic. Software, third-party selection. Here's the iTunes App Store. This is Google Play Store. You're going to find all the same major apps on both platforms. No longer is there a divide like there used to be with Android. So when Farmville comes out, it's going to be available for both iOS and Android. There's off third-party Office Suites, and by the way, both of these come with their own Office Suite. Apple has iWork, and that's a free download, and you get Polaris Office 5 on the Samsung Galaxy S5. Really, this, this is a pretty much an even race at this point. Once in a while, iOS still gets some hot game first. They get a couple of weeks or a month lead on it, but other than that, you got it all on both platforms. Now, the, the software ecosystem is maybe on even footing, but, you know, not so much the, the accessory ecosystem. Sure, with Samsung, there'll be plenty of cases out there for the Galaxy S5, that's for sure. But, you know, there's a cottage industry that revolves around all things iOS. So there's just a bazillion iPhone, iPad accessories, docks, keyboards, speakers, you name it. There is so much stuff. So for those of you who just love accessorizing your phone, getting all kinds of doodads to go with it, the iPhone is still going to win because there's just a mad number of accessories for it. For those of you who just want a case and that's good enough, well, then the Samsung Galaxy S5 is fine. And there certainly will be plenty of third-party cases in addition to Samsung's own case. In terms of battery life, battery is sealed inside the iPhone. We all know that by now, don't we? It's good for about a day with moderate use. And I mean pretty, pretty decent use, not I made one phone call and checked my email once. I mean checking your email throughout the day, web browsing, streaming a few movies, making calls, that sort of thing. 
Samsung has a removable battery. Good times. This peels right off, and then you have access to the 2800 milliamp battery. And the Snapdragon 801 is also a wildly powerful frugal CPU. So it and the HTC One M8, both running on the same platform, both have pretty beefy batteries, are the champs. Just like the LG G2 actually was pretty impressive as well. And I would say with the same moderate use, you can go about a day and a half on the charge. So significantly longer, and yes, you can swap in batteries. Of course, with the iPhone, as I mentioned, with accessories coming out your ears. There are so many battery packs. We've reviewed a bunch of those on Mobile Tech Review on our website too. So there are certainly ways to get a charge going for this guy on the road. But if you just want to swap in spare batteries, the Samsung still has its appeal. Of course, you can still use external chargers with the Samsung as well if they're USB based. Now when it comes to camera, again, it's the keep it simple principle Apple has. The software features on the iPhone camera, they're pretty basic, they're pretty limited, but the thing manages to take stunning pictures. And you have your shutter button, of course, over here, your slider to choose square video, normal video, uh, photo rather, and video modes. This over here, a couple of basic color filters. Not a whole lot going on, but boy, everybody knows it. it may not be the highest resolution camera on the market, but it takes very nice sharp shots with good colors and good exposure and balance. So that's the iPhone's 8 megapixel camera, 1.2 megapixel up front. Aha, uh -huh. now the Samsung, of course, because they're going to outspec Apple every time. That's what they have to do to try to fight Apple's market share. 16 megapixel camera on the back. They both have LED flashes, by the way. 2 megapixel camera on the front. Pretty nice front camera. Actually, the iPhone does a very good job considering it has 1.2 megapixel camera for video chat, but Samsung does look better. But the Samsung's camera is one of the better camera phones on the market. It is really good. And let's take a look at the camera software. So here we have Samsung's camera application, not unlike the iPhone and many other phones too. We have switch front and rear cameras over here, HDR on and off, settings over here, modes, access to the last picture you shot, picture versus video over here. I like the photo versus video. It's pretty clear you don't have to go hunting for them. But mode gives you Beauty face, auto, panorama, virtual tour, dual camera mode. You can do front and back camera kind of thing there. And if that wasn't enough for you in settings, all of these things here. It's just crazy. So a whole lot of settings here for those of you who are more advanced photographers and love to fiddle with settings and use some of the features here, like they have the new background blur feature and other post-processing things. A lot going on here. And sometimes it's not such a bad thing. I won't fault Samsung for that. It's nice to have those options, but if you ignore all those and just leave it on auto, it's going to take really beautiful photos and video. And also, it can shoot 4K video versus just 1080p on the iPhone. Now, you might say, what do I need 4K for? I don't have a 4K monitor or 4K TV. Even if you're playing it back on just a regular 1920 by 1080 monitor or TV, you're going to notice that it is sharper. So, let's turn the phone off. Why? Because we're going to test out the fingerprint scanner. Now, the fingerprint scanner on the iPhone 5S is the granddaddy of actual usable fingerprint fingerprint scanners on a phone. Yes, the Motorola Atrix had it, but it was kind of like the same thing you'd find on an older Lenovo ThinkPad. Didn't really work very well. So this one, you just lay a finger on the home button. You can press on the home button and do that. Just as easy as that. And for those of you who want to hold it with one hand and do it, you can also do it just by, if you've enrolled your thumbprint, doing it this way. Now with the Samsung Galaxy S5, it also works very well, but there's one but right there. You see it tells you to swipe right here, which is just fine. So it's a two-handed thing. So for those of you who find that really annoying and you want to use it one-handed, well, there that is. But other than that, it works quite well. Now the iPhone gets better nods for security because after you screw up your password login attempt, say somebody says, wow, you must have a whole lot of money. So we're going to lift your fingerprint off, a good copy of it. We're going to make a model of it, and we're going to swipe that on there. Well, after a certain number of failed swipes, say it's not the greatest model, because it's pretty hard to make a really good model of somebody's finger, it should insist on the password even after a reboot. Samsung doesn't do that. That's something that they could change in software, but they're not doing it right now. Now, with Samsung's fingerprint scanner, you can use it to unlock your phone. You can use it in conjunction with your PayPal account, but until they change that, that business about having it not prompt for a password after successive failed attempts at swiping, I wouldn't use it. And you can also use it with your Samsung account. With Apple, the API belongs to them and them only, so you can use it for the iTunes store for purchases and for unlocking your phone. For you fitness-oriented folks, another sensor that Samsung has added is the heart rate monitor. That's on the back. That is where the LED flashes. You lay your finger on there and it will tell you your pulse. Also comes with S Health. Very basic. It has a pedometer in there. You can measure 
your caloric intake, that sort of thing. So it's not going to replace a Fitbit or something like that, or even Samsung's Gear Fit watch, but some basic stuff there. The iPhone, you're going to buy third-party stuff to do that sort of thing. But again, I, I think most fitness folks who are really that into it to buy accessories really want a little bit more information than S Health gives. S Health's kind of a good starter thing when you're first getting into your whole fitness regime. One thing I can say about the Samsung is it is water resistant and dust resistant. So you can go out and play on the beach, get a little splash with some water, get a little hit with some sand and the phone will be fine. In fact, you can rinse this off in the sink up to three feet immersion for up to 30 minutes in water. You got to make sure your port door is closed. There's a door over the USB port over here and make sure the battery, is, battery back is snapped on tight. And there you go. With our iPhone, it it doesn't really resist much of anything. Sorry about that, but it's very pretty. <clears throat> yeah. So there it is. Be beyond your, your fanboyism, your preference for any given platform, your preference for size. I mean, for some folks, you know who you are. Big versus small, that's what you want. As always, the Samsung Galaxy products trounce the iPhone in terms of features. As always, the iPhone trances, trounces the Samsung Galaxy in terms of, ooh, uh, beautiful looks and consistency of the operating system and simplicity and ease of use. So it really depends on what you want. Do you, do you look at this as a fashion accessory? Some people do, and there's nothing wrong with that. Do you look at this as the utilitarian thing? And the more features you can get, the better, the more powerful, the better, the more screen real estate, the better you get the idea. So hopefully now you guys have an easier time figuring out which of these two is for you. So ladies and gents, the iPhone 5S, the Samsung Galaxy S5, either way, you're probably going to love your phone. These are two of the nicer, nicest phones on the market. Obviously, different strokes for different folks. Do you like the whole ecosystem around the iPhone, the support, the, the portable size, or do you want the big screen and all the features on the Samsung Galaxy S5? I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website to read the written reviews of both of these products, watch our video reviews of these products, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.